Today I wanted to touch on a couple of the difficult areas that relate to the management of lithium toxicity. In summary, we do know where lithium sits in the periodic table. It's really very close to sodium and as a consequence of being on the periodic table it's got low liposolubility, it's really excreted and handled very much like sodium and it has pretty slow redistribution into other tissues. Its therapeutic range for maintenance treatments is much lower than most labs report. Its exact therapeutic mechanism is incompletely described but we do know that it's uptake in distal renal cells and this is the cause of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. This graph gives you an idea of the relative concentrations in different body compartments. Following a therapeutic dose you get fairly rapid and complete absorption into the plasma with slower equilibration into the red blood cells and even slower into the brain. The relative slow equilibration between plasma and brain is important to consider both when we're working out the risk from acute toxicity and also the treatment of chronic toxicity. While the bioavailability in therapeutic doses is said to be very, very high, this does not appear to be the case as you push the dose up. Certainly in overdose patients rarely achieve the blood levels you would predict, suggesting that either absorption is saturable or that intercurrent vomiting and diarrhea limits absorption. This is a diagram of the nephron. Like sodium, lithium is freely filtered at the glomerulus and also like sodium can be reuptake back into the body throughout the nephron. So in situations where the body is sodium depleted or the kidney is receiving low loads of sodium there will be active resorption of sodium and, and also of lithium. The kidney off obviously handles water and it, it does through, through these aquaporins and the aquaporin 2 to 4 in the distal tubular cells is very important in the genesis of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So this is summarised in this slide. In patients with lithium toxicity, our major concern is generally the development of chronic neurological morbidity. It is possible with high levels for patients to get cardiovascular effects, including QT prolongation, but most commonly you'll just see T wave, uh, non specific T wave changes. There are sp specific comorbidities that are due to lithium, predominantly nephrogenic diabetes insipidus and hyper or hypothyroidism and hyperparathyroidism which may also complicate the treatment. Finally other medical conditions that cause co-prescription or other comorbidities will also complicate lithium toxicity and increase its risk. So here's a brief case that we're going to revisit a little bit later on but this is a man found unconscious on the floor by his family. Not sure how long he was there but when they arrived, they thought he may have been having a seizure. His GCS was 10. He was febrile and hypertensive. He was subsequently found to have an aspiration. He had a long history of polydipsia, drinking 12 litres of fluid a day. He required intubation and transfer to the intensive care unit. These are on his bloods on admission. Note the really high urea and creatinine the CK which was due to some rhabdomyolysis on his right buttock, the hypercalcemia which turned out to be hyperparathyroidism and the very high lithium level. Going through his old outpatient notes it was apparent that he'd been maintained with a high lithium level of at least 1.5 for a few months. His raised white cell count was in part due to an aspiration pneumonia. This is some data from the Scottish Poison Centre, an examination of all the patients referred with lithium poisoning. And you'll note it's been separated into three groups, acute, acute on therapeutic and chronic. The patient we're discussing at the moment falls into this group. The acute group describes a group of patients who have not got any background lithium treatment and have just taken a, 
a single ingestion for the first time. So there is no body load of lithium at the time that they've ingested lithium. The acute on therapeutic are patients who are chronically on lithium and have then had an acute ingestion on top of that. So their body is loaded up. And the chronic, as is this patient, um, have been either on high doses of lithium or have had some interference with lithium excretion. There's been no adjustment here for other co-ingested medications, but as you can see, you're more likely to have impaired consciousness with chronic toxicity or acute on therapeutic toxicity. Not terribly much difference in other symptoms, although there is more neurological symptoms in patients, patients who are already loaded with lithium, notably the hyperreflexia, and also you'll note that 5.6% of patients reported to have seizures. This paper is almost 35 years old, but it's still very important. The authors of this paper developed a grading of lithium toxicity based on 23 of their own cases and a review of 100 cases from the literature. And this grading is probably most important um, and correlates best with chronic toxicity rather than acute toxicity. What's probably very important about this paper is that in the 23 patients that they saw, they followed them up. And out of that follow-up, they found two patients with chronic neurological sequelae, that is, sequelae that persisted for greater than two months. And also they had two deaths in that case series. This is really the only prospective study of a follow-up of patients in the literature looking for chronic neurological sequelae. If you apply the clinical grades of toxicity to the Scottish data, what you'll notice is that the high grades, that is grade 3 and grade 4 of toxicity, are only really seen predominantly in patients with acute on chronic or chronic toxicity, not acute toxicity. Or in plain English, what this is saying is that major acute neurological, to neurological toxicity is, is more commonly seen on acute on chronic and chronic toxicity. The Newcastle series published in 2001 of 97 cases is the largest consecutive series of patients presenting to a, acutely to a unit. You'll note that there were no deaths in this series, so medical management had moved on. 28 cases were reported as having severe neurotoxicity in their acute admission, but no follow-up of those patients following discharge is reported. Seven of the patients underwent dialysis. We're moving on to nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, and we're going to be mostly concerned with lithium toxicity as a cause of nephrogenic, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, but hypercalcemia, which can be associated with hyperparathyroidism due to lithium, is another cause. Hypokalemia is an additional cause. On top of lithium, there are quite a number of drugs that can cause nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, but we're not going to deal with that now. Lithium-induced nephrogenic diabetes insipidus is a failure of the aquaporins in the collecting duct to resorb water. Normally, vasopressin, vasopressin binds to a receptor which stimulates adenylene cyclase. This leads to a downstream effect through cyclocaine P to produce aquaporin 2. This aquaporin 2 then moves to, moves to the membrane where it can uptake water from the collecting duct. That water moves into the cell and moves out back into the medullary interstitium through other aquaporins. When lithium accumulates in a cell, it reduces adenylene cyclase activity, leading to the downstream effect of a decreased production of the aquaporin tr transporter, and so therefore less water uptake. So lithium-induced nephrogetic diabetes insipidus is common. In case series, 20 to 55% of patients will actually have symptoms, and 20% of patients produce more than 3 litres of urine a day. The sort of things that I find useful to ask a patient in their history is how much water they keep in the refrigerator and in particular how many bottles of water they take to bed with them at night. You can also ask for a history of polyuria, in particular 
not curative, that surprisingly many patients underreport this. If you were in the lithium prescribing business, you might consider co prescribing amyloride because amyloride blocks lithium uptake into the distal cells and probably protects from the subsequent development of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. The treatment of established nephrogenic diabetes insipidus is difficult. Thiazides are often suggested as a possible treatment. In my hands, I've never found them to be particularly effective. The logic for using thiazides in the absence of ongoing lithium treatment is described in this slide. So the general management is to cease lithium, to mildly salt restrict the patient intake and add a small dose of thiazide, but it's very important to make sure the patient is allowed to maintain their normal oral fluid intake. One of the common areas where things go astray in a hospital go astray in hospital is when the treating doctor thinks the patient might have cytogenic polydipsia or for other re reasons fluid restricts the patient. A significant question in a patient with lithium toxicity is whether or not they should be dialyzed. The literature suggests lots of different levels but there's virtually no evidence for any of this. In particular there's not much evidence that di dialyzing a patient with lithium will reduce their neurological toxicity, but this may be hard to assess. Most clinicians consider the use of dialysis in patients who have evidence of CNS toxicity and significant renal impairment. Dialysis can effectively remove lithium It is common to see a rebound increase in lithium levels between dialysis sessions as lithium redistributes from other compartments. Dialysis is not good at removing lithium directly from any intracellular space or from any deep compartment, but at least may allow you to establish a gradient. It's commonly stated in the textbooks that there is no evidence that it changes neurological outcome, at least chronic neurological outcome, but this effectively has not been examined. This is the often quoted article for the so-called silent syndrome, the syndrome of irreversible lithium effectuated neurotoxicity. And what these authors simply did is they only reviewed all the cases in the literature of chronic lithium toxicity. This is neurological sequelae that lasted longer than two months after an acute episode of toxicity. So this is in no way a prospective study at all. As such, it doesn't really address these important questions of what is the risk of chronic neurotoxicity? What does it actually look like? What is the mechanisms? And more importantly, what do we need to do when we have a patient in front of us? The authors then categorise the silent syndrome into typical presentations and atypical presentations. And by far, clinically, the most common thing we see is cerebellar dysfunction. But you'll notice when you look down here that really they're describing a, a huge range of neurological sequelae from central to peripheral neuropathy. The authors make the comment that the atypical presentations, these ones here, have unlikely to undergone an acute organic brain syndrome. By that they mean an acute delirium. Nevertheless, you have to consider if you've got such a widespread neurological science all attributed to one agent, that the mechanism is going to be unusual. There is evidence for direct neurotoxicity from lithium. In this study, looking at the growth of neurons in, in cell culture, you can see that with the lithium concentrations down on the x-axis here, within the therapeutic range for lithium, there is a demonstrable decrease in the develop, development of neurites. Similar cell 
cell studies that look at ATP production within a cell show that within concentrations of lithium that we commonly see in toxicity that cellular ATP production starts to drop off providing another possible mechanism for neurological dysfunction. This paper shows that you can demonstrate changes in both chronic and acute lithium treatment throughout the brain of at least of a rat. The interesting thing about this study is that the cerebellum in the rat was the least affected compared to other areas of the brain, so somewhat in distinction to what we commonly see clinically. So this may be an issue with the model, but it could also speak to potential other causes. So the question is, what can we do as clinicians to try and address all of these particular risks, and in particular these ones here? Much of the focus has always been to remove lithium. And I'm not arguing against that as, a, as an approach in patients with severe clinical neurotoxicity when they present. However, I do suggest that there are other things that we need to address. And to, as an example, I'll go back to the, the patient we presented earlier, and this is showing his serum sodium here related to dialysis and during the course of his stay. And what I want you to see here is that his sodium abruptly had increased to above 160. This occurred when, when medical staff decided he might have poly, def, psychogenic polydipsia and restricted his fluid intake just modestly. So his serum sodium has fluctuated up and gone down subsequently quite slowly once they realised they needed to manage that. But these fluctuations in sodium, of course, could be terribly important and they're important because of their association, association with central pontine and extra pontine myelinosis, well demonstrated in many situations of rapidly fluctuating sodium and certainly reported in patients with lithium toxicity. So meticulous management of the nephrogenic diabetes insipidus and the electrolyte status is something that we need to be very careful to impart to anyone we're giving advice to or when we're managing patients ourselves. The next thing to consider that we can easily treat is to consider whether or not the patient has got non-convulsive status, status seizures because if that is the case that can also be associated with neurological injury and is easily relatively easily managed. We should also consider the possibility of thiamine deficiency in particular with patients with chronic lithium toxicity. These patients may be at risk from a dietary point of view, they may also have co-ingestion of other substances, in particular alcohol. There are obviously similarities in the pathophysiology that we see clinically, that is predominantly a cerebellar syndrome, and the administration of thiamine is a very low risk procedure. So I think we need to take a more holistic approach towards brain protection in addition to um, addressing the high levels of lithium, addressing the risk of large fluctuations in sodium, the potential for thiamine deficiency, the potential for seizure, we should also make certain that we actively treat uh, fever and any other things that we think may contribute to brain injury. So my final recommendation is if you're giving advice remotely on patients with lithium toxicity, you need to we need to consider having more structured data collection. In particular, we want to know about the type of lithium toxicity, whether it's acute, acute and chronic, or chronic, the type of lithium preparation, and we need to do follow-up. Our advice should not just purely focus on lithium levels, but we also need to perhaps give a lot more instruction on the management of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, detection of seizures, treatment of fever, removal of drugs that may complicate things, and I think virtually all of these patients should be given thiamine. Thank you all for your attention.